Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I am Greg Tito, and I am joined by Mr. Chris Perkins. Hello. And today on this segment where we dive into little bits of D&D lore, we are going to talk about scary monsters. There's a lot of scary monsters out there in Dungeons and Dragons. There Uh, are. We use them. Most of them are pretty scary when you think about it. Uh, But for this one, we wanted to delve into uh, more topical, traditional scary monsters that you may not see all the time. Uh, And that could be uh, themed for a Halloween-y type one-shot. We talked about Domains of Dread most recently uh, on Lori Chanel. But here's some other things that you could add that aren't an entire adventure, but at least something that you can... So you True. Can use. Yes. Uh, so like ghosts, uh, things like that, or, or yeah, you, it's hard to go wrong with ghosts. Yes. And their possession ability can make for some fun role playing, as it turns out. Exactly, because that's yeah. that's that's horrifying. Yes. Like having your control taken away from a player. Yes. And you can you can really sort of play with the ghosts' ethereal ability, which is to say that they don't have to reveal themselves right away. They can make things jangle and rattle before they show up to terrify you with their presence. Um, and so I think the best ghosts are the ones who aren't just, you know, floating in front of you and waving. Um, they're the ones that are writing things on dust in the floor and uh, causing creaks and growls and other strange noises. Yeah, it, it's a slow build is the best one where it's like, OK, yeah. there's a foreshadowing. That's weird. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's probably nothing. And yes. then it gets creepier and creepier. Yes, yes. Yeah, until there's red rum in Red rum. And, and, and blood written on the mirror. Oh, yes. That's a reference to The Shining, kids. <laughs> <laughs> a very vo- very ancient film by Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> Based on an even more ancient Stephen King novel. It's bit before your time, <laughs> youngins. <laughs> Read your literature. That's what we do. We steal all our ideas from some previous yes. works. Yes, it came from a book. <laughs> Which is a thing with pages in it. Um, uh, yeah. So like a pamphlet? They, I get it's cool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, ghosts are, are great for that reason. Uh, yeah, they're, they're good old standbys. Uh, a monster that probably doesn't get much credit uh, for being a good horror monster, but is a ton of fun to play the, the sheer horror of, is Kuatoa. Oh, why would you say that? The reason I would is because of their Lovecraftian roots. Mm. Um, Lovecraft monsters... Uh, have a warm, fuzzy place in D anD D, or a wet, slimy, place. a wet, slimy place. Uh, Gary Gygax was a fan of Lovecraft and counted Lovecraft as one of the inspirations for Dungeons and Dragons. And mm. so, there are a plethora of Lovecraftian monsters that show up, including mind flayers. Yes, but Kuato are often unsung um, antagonists. One of the delightful things about them is, in their lore, they used to be human. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, they were humans who basically were subjugated by mind flayers or creatures like them mm-hmm. and degen- were degenerated into their current mad state. fish And so they're these slimy, sticky, crazy fish-like humanoids that live underground or in the darkest depths of the world, mm-hmm. uh, be that in the deep seas or in the deep caverns of the underdark. Um, one of their cool... Uh, traits is sort of this otherworldly insight that they have. They might seem like just sort of gibbering maniacs, uh, but they do have this kind of otherworldly perception. Yeah. And so you can play with that as a DM to sort of suggest maybe they're besetting this village because they can sort of, they have some prescience about somebody who's come to the village that they want to join their ranks or who's destined to lead them or whatever. Mm. The other great thing about Kuatoa is that they invent their own gods. Right. So they, when they are, when they need sort of, uh, when their, their faith is tested or when they need leadership or when they're ready to act, they basically craft their gods as icons out of whatever detritus they can dig up. Um, often piecemealing things together to create these absolutely horrid mm-hmm. mishmash creatures. And if they believe in these icons strongly enough, they can make these gods actually physically manifest. Mm. So you could have a whole adventure where, you know, Kuatoa are raiding areas around an old settlement, gathering up things to fashion a god in some sunken cave somewhere or in some pirate ship wreck that's sort of crashed off the rocks 
And if they succeed, this God will rise up out of the sea and devour everyone. Interesting. And that's, that's something you can do to almost combine what we were talking about with ghosts and mm-hmm. this being that is conjured up by the collective belief of the yes. village of Kuatoa. Yeah. You know, where something strange is happening. Maybe the, the human settlement nearby is like, there's these things going on and we don't know what it means. And there's these dead fish heads that keeps, you know, coming up and we yeah. don't know why. You know, and then you fo- slowly over time discover that it was this effigy yes that yeah. is now brought to life exactly they might need you know parts of people to help make the effigy too so Ooh. koatoa scouting parties going in with sticky nets grabbing people and dragging them back to their lair Ooh, that's creepy yes they could be yes, yes. <laughs> speaking uh, of creepy yeah an, another sort of uh, good scare monster although it's not often used this way is the drow yeah uh, because they were uh, they were always sort of originally portrayed as these sort of trapdoor spider-esque underground dwelling um, predator monsters, these boogeymen who would come up in the dead of night, slip into towns, murder people, or drag them away to be slaves. Right. Uh, that's a pretty creepy concept. And then when you consider that they actually worship a demon goddess in like a giant abyssal web, <laughs> the idea that they might you know, sacrifice to her to please her uh, sets some pretty amazing stakes. Yeah. It does. And so if you kind of play them like boogeymen, um, you know, coming up out of the underdark and you actually have to chase them down back into the darkness, right. that could be really creepy and fun. And a lot of people, you know, because of the excellent storytelling by R.A. Salvatore, you think of, you know, oh, they can be redeemed. But that was the reason why Drist is uh, treated the way he is on the above mm-hmm. ground is because it's, in Drow are these boogeymen that like yes. you know, steal away children and, and uh, uh, yep. you know, sacrifice them to Loth. So um, there's a lot of terror that involved in that. And even anything that doesn't involve the drow at all, they'd be like, oh, that was the drow that, that did that. Yep, yep. Um, another, another terrifying monster or group of monsters are hags. Yes, I know you love hags. I do, and so does Jeremy Crawford. So we kind of, we kind of share um, our love of hags. The hag love. Um, yeah, hag love going on. Uh, so <laughs> Hashtag hag love. Hags work best in covens, but they also work well alone. Yes. You can have the lo- the old the old witch in the hut or the old witch in the, the Baba Yaga. Kind yeah, of exactly, trope. kind of figure. Uh, but a coven of hags is terrifying because they have heightened spell casting abilities. Uh, one of the most uh, now the Volo's Guide to Monsters, which came out over a year ago, um, talked a lot about hags. But one of their most sort of disturbing and compelling features is that they procreate by. <laughs> Uh, basically um, having ordinary people carry their young, as it were. Uh, You know, a a woman in a town could be pregnant and give birth to a young girl, and it's not until that young girl turns the age of 13 when you realize that before she was born, she was swapped out with a hag child, and so she just suddenly transforms into a hag. Yeah, Um, and there's a lot of... Uh, I guess almost surgical horror. You know, you yes. think of we, we mentioned X Files uh, a lot, yes. but uh, that is what's happening to Dana Scully uh, as mm-hmm. well. Uh, yes. Uh, well, spoiler alert for yep. a twenty-year-old show. Uh, Anybody but, who wants to go hunting for a really good hag adventure, by the way, um, an old issue of Dungeon Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> what issue number? Fifty-nine. <laughs> <laughs> had an adventure called The Mother's Curse, which yes. was basically that um, a hag has has uh, set up to have a daughter and um, is using yeah. some poor. And woman. you can use a lot of, um, you know, almost Grimm's uh, fairy tale. It's very tropes, Grimm fairy tale. Uh, but going dark. Yes. Very, very, very dark. Yeah. Another sort of dark fey like predatory monster. One other thing I'll say about hags too is you can, one of the cool things about hags is their willingness to deal with you. They always want something, so they'll they'll give you something, some power, some benefit, you know, your true one true love, mm-hmm. beauty, power, whatever you want, but then they call it in. You have to pay it off, and that debt is almost always more than the person can stand. Yeah. So you can imagine a vicar or a mayor of a small town who to protect the town basically made a deal with a hag, and now that time has expired and the hag is coming to collect, and maybe it's the characters who have to protect the vicar from the hags, mm. you know, coming. Um, or broker a new deal or something exactly. like that. Exactly. But a monster that plays very well with hags are thi- monsters that play well with hags are things like crawling claws, hags that murder assassins, cut off their hands, and animate them through necromantic magic. Um, 
or scare, happens all the time. Scarecrows. Yes. Uh, scarecrows are scarecrows. creepy to me. Very, I, I love scarecrows. And some, yeah. some of the, the art that came out of fourth edition for scarecrows was some of the creepiest art we'd ever seen. Yeah. Um, and uh, Oni. Yes. Good old yes. ogre mages. Yes. They are. Uh, the Oni of fifth edition are particularly creepy because their preferred meal is children. So that's pretty dark. Yeah. Um, Can't go much darker than that. Exactly. It, it's kind of like the classic creature in the closet, creature under the bed motif. This thing sneaks up and devours little kids or tries to lure them away in some disguise. Uh, and that, of course, can wreak havoc on the sanctity and peace of mind of any small village. Right. Yes. Uh, those, uh, yeah, so those are easy to weave in uh, uh, to any campaign that's going on, but now would be a perfect time to do so if you're in the, the, yes. the, the, the horror yeah. mode. Uh, if you're looking Halloween. for something a little more, shall we say, substantial, mm. might I recommend the Death Knight? Oh, people um, don't use the Death Knights they don't. Really anymore. No, not so much. Um, uh, you know, there have been, there's at least one classic Death Knight, and that's Lord Soth from the Dragonlance and yes. later Ravenloft setting. Um, but the idea of this ancient warrior who refuses to die, mm. um, you could have the idea of, you know, there's a, there's an old death knight basically living in the castle on the hill waiting for the day to, you know, bring his armies up from the dead, you know, to ravage the land or conquer his enemies. Um, uh, is there a way to use that? I mean, of course, now I'm just kind of spitballing for story stuff, but like, you know, early on in a campaign that can be used as an antagonist. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Now, Death Knights are very powerful. They're like CR 17 monsters. Right. But maybe the, you're the, the effects of that type of thing. Correct. As the players uh, uh, and their characters grow in power, maybe yeah. Aragorn style, you're using that Death Knight's armies against a greater evil somehow. Precisely, yes. Because they're lawful. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you have to actually go talk to the Death Knight. Maybe maybe there is some other threat to the land and if you can convince the Death Knight to basically bra- raise his army yeah. back from the dead, the Death Knight will defend the land against this new encroaching evil. Right. But woe be to you if you betray the Death Knight or don't follow through on you know his demands or what he or she wants. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of bargaining and and, and, and finding out. Yeah, when you're dealing with somebody that powerful, you have to be very, very cautious. It's not just, it's not maybe not a threat you can destroy. And actually the way Death Knights are written up, they can't be destroyed. Ever? Well, you can can sort of destroy their form, but they come back. Right. They essentially, until they feel like their mission in death, in undeath is over, Mm -hmm. they don't cease to exist. Uh, They're even more powerful and... um, persistent than liches in that way with a lich you can destroy its phylactery yes there's a there's yeah. a, 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 a death knight way. a death knight exists through sheer force of will mm. and until it decides that it doesn't want to be around anymore it will keep coming back which is terrifying that is terrifying do you think the uh you know i mean a lich is a is a great antagonist do you think they have a a, a creepy component that you could bring to life Oh, no. Liches are warm. Yeah, they're super super nice. (laughs) Yeah, we'll save those for Easter. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Obviously, any any undead is fair game, I think. That's sort of, I wouldn't call it low-hanging fruit, but, you know, you can look at an undead and pretty much concoct any horror story you want to. Yeah. I think that... um, um, of, of the undead, it seems like death knights get the less use than liches. We see liches all the time. Right. Um, and that's understandable. They're very, very cool, like vampires and whatnot. Um, but in just trying to reach into my mind for some of the more sort of obscure monsters, uh, that would probably be like the one, the death yeah. knight would be the one that doesn't see as much use these days. Yeah. And it, and it builds on some other tropes of like, you know, the horsemen or like that. Uh, yes. You could yeah. almost do a headless horseman style, but with a death knight exactly. in the role. And it's like, well, we can't really kill this guy. And he, you know, so we've got to figure out some other way right. of stopping him either by finding his head or oh, finding yeah. his, the, you know, maybe his sword got broken at some point and the blade is hidden yeah. somewhere. If you can, if you can retrieve the blade, he'll, you know, link the weapon together into one, that sword will suddenly redeem him and he'll just turn to dust before your eyes. Mm. There's all kinds of playroom there. I'm trying to think of other... There's something that you mentioned in the last uh, lore you should know uh, about a sentient sword. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's something Uh, that people don't really think about a lot. It's evil magic items that have their own malevolent (laughs) force to them. Exactly. One uh, One of my favorite things to do is to take 
uh, an otherwise ordinary magic item and given it give it some malevolence. Yeah. And it could be a weapon, or it doesn't have to be. It could be like um, a hangman's rope mm. that has gained sentience and is basically looking to finish the work uh, that its previous owner, um, who maybe was killed before his time, um, and so it's like a relic. Usually, usually the item is a reflection of some of some creator or some previous owner yeah. and seeks to complete the work that its previous owner could not. Right. And so the hangman's noose that's basically creeping around and strangling people in the night Ooh. makes for a sort of insidious threat. Yeah, because um, otherwise it's just a pile of rope. Yes. The, the pipes of the sewers that can basically possess its owner and then use the owner to summon rat swarms to devour his enemies Yeesh. would also be kind of a fun thing to play with a headband or helm uh that you know conveys the thoughts of the long departed into the mind of its wearer mm. and so sort of transforms you into someone can lend uh, a really spooky narrative to your story where the hero having acquired this item doesn't realize that they're sort of under its sway they might wake up in the morning with blood all over their hands and their uh, gear and not know where it came from. And it's only because they have forgotten that they were basically possessed the night before by the item in their possession and went on a rampage. Yeesh, yeah. So there's a whole lot of things you can do with sentient items. And yeah. you're right. It's a seldom explored opportunity for, for true horror. Have you ever run a, uh, like a monkey's paw type adventure where it, uh, uh, a magic item or, or a being Mm -hmm. gives you the v wishes that you ever would, would desire, but, t you know, twist them in some way. Uh, no, I haven't, but that's a really clever idea. Um, you know, what would be a good monkey's paw in, in D and D besides yeah. the, the obvious hand of Vecna? Yeah. Um, but like, you know, a, yeah. a ring of wishes that yes. uh, is actually an evil ring of wishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got like the, some sort of evil genie bound inside of it who can only escape if you end if it tricks you into wishing for something specific mm. um, and and is sort of malevolently guiding you toward uh, making wishes that further its own ends well, um, maybe you have to wish it out of the ring and that's yeah, the only maybe. way yeah, so yeah, it exactly. tricks you into doing that right um, or maybe there's a price for every wish you know it sucks the soul out of it draws its energy from somewhere it's not just giving you something for free you know, something yeah, there's a price that's there's paid. A, there's a hidden price somewhere, and maybe you have to research the ring to find out even what the what what the the hook is, what the thing is, um, before you make a wish that's going to cost you dearly. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really interesting. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, um, so if you if you want to really play with something weird and fun, um, the mimic. Oh, it's you pretty simple. You wouldn't think of it as a good horror monster, but actually. Given its nature, it can inspire some serious horror. Just, just the normal mimic, uh, especially when you real. <laughs> I was gonna. Let, let me come back for the mimic just for a second. Okay. Well, before I forget, I also want to mention the Otiug. Oh, the garbage monster. The garbage monster. The garbage eating, awful eating monster. Uh, you don't normally think of that as being a horror story monster. It's more like just an underground creature you encounter in a garbage pile or whatever that attacks you. Yeah. Until you realize that the Otiug has limited telepathy. So it can speak. So it can basically you. communicate with you. And the idea that, you know, this garbage monster is basically um, musing on the how it's going to, you know, tear you apart and feast on your flesh, <laughs> even before you even know what it is. Uh, uh, and you can have it crawling up from below. Maybe it sort of got up into the sewers of a city and is now hiding in back alleys and garbage piles and basically dragging people to their doom. And the last thing they hear is the whispers of this creature in their mind. Like, I'm going to chew you exactly. and digest you slowly all the so, time. But in the topic of Mimic, um, yeah. there was an old dungeon adventure called The Vanishing Village in issue 19. <laughs> 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 and it introduced us to the House Hunter, which is basically a huge Mimic that can assume the form of a small house. Oh. And its shtick is, you know, it waits until you literally walk into it before, you know, all of its windows reveal themselves to be just, you know, the eyes, eyes the thing. and thing. Oh. And, and so you are basically in its gullet as it engulfs you suddenly. And the premise of this adventure is you, you find this village that is on no map. 
and that nobody ever remembers having passed through before. And that's because all of the buildings are house hunter mimics. They're, they're like a pack that move around. And they just set up, yeah. here's a ghost town. Exactly. But you could also imagine the same thing, like a gigantic mimic that's basically taken the form of a wizard's tower that yeah. appears on a lonely hill out of nowhere. And you think, where did this tower come from? We've got to go check it out. And the village is like, yeah, go check it out. That's weird. And as soon as you walk inside it, suddenly all the stairs become amorphous and the glue from the mimic starts to seize you. Mm. Appendages come out and grab you and you find yourself fighting your way out of the monster. Itself. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. You start to be digested for, for uh, 10,000 years inside the mimic. Exactly. Mm. So that's, that's a case where somebody clearly took an existing monster and kind of extrapolated to make it as w bad as possible. Mm. So we're going to make it super big and it can look like a house or it can look like a tower. You can imagine that there may be other monsters where you can just say, okay, is there a version of this monster that's even scarier than what's in the monster manual? Mm. And, and there's, because it is D&D, there's, I think... What all of these almost have in common is uh, the act of discovery. Like you think it's one thing, right? But there's it's always the twist, the surprise. The 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 monster is either not what you thought it was, or it's more complicated, or um, than than you than you thought it was, or it's hidden in some crafty, clever way. It's learned to adapt yeah. under its particular circumstances. The evil sentient sword is a good example of that. It doesn't look evil. You may not even know it's evil until it's too late. Right. It's already in your sway. Yeah, right. You're already yeah. under its it's in your gut or it's in your friend. Or it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's led you down a path that you don't want to walk. Exactly. So it's about, as a dungeon master, it's all about yes. uh, giving uh, small clues so yes. that when the twist happens, it's not yes. a, oh, I didn't even think that was even possible. You want it to be the dread of like, oh, I know this is going to be bad and it is bad. They just, it's not exactly the way they thought it was going to be bad. And yeah, it's, exactly. it's a hard thing to pull off. Absolutely. But, uh, and basically, but it starts with, I'm going to take a monster and I'm going to add one thing to it. What's that thing? What's that thing that's going to surprise the players? And it's got to be something better than it's yellow instead of brown. Um, <laughs> that's creepy. Yellow <laughs> instead of brown. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, if it's, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a whale and, uh, or, 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 or an otherwise ordinary animal and, uh, combine it with the Druid's Awaken spell and now give it intelligence. Mm. So now it's not just a bear, it's an awakened bear. It's a bear that thinks and talks like a human. What does that mean for this creature and how can it now use or adapt to its newfound power uh, to, to make it even more formidable or dangerous? And steal all of the picnic baskets. And steal all the picnic baskets. That's yes. from a cartoon from the 60s, people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yogi Bear, watch it up. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that's uh, uh, a, a great uh, kind of overview of ways that you can incorporate creepy monsters uh, into any D and D game, but hopefully more yeah. uh, during this. And if you can use my all-time favorite monster, you know, all-time all favorite creep out monster, the uh, Scarecrow, all the better. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's something weird about Scarecrows. Yeah. Yes. And you can do fun things with them by saying, you know, that that guy that you killed or hanged, his spirit is now in the Scarecrow, coming mm. back for you. It's very revenant like. Yeah. Yeah. It's after that hangman's noose. Mm -hmm. Trying to find right. it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And you, combining monsters is another way to create surprise. Yeah. Take two monsters that don't normally w work together and put them together right. and suddenly and how does terrifying. This, and it's the relationship is yes, terrifying. Yes, exactly. Anyway. Yeah. Cool stuff. All right. How can people get in touch with you, Mr. Grace Perkins? I am at Twitter, uh, no, on Twitter, <laughs> at Chris Perkins DND. Excellent. I'm yes. um, very excited about uh, this Halloween slash horror season. So hopefully you'll see some more stuff yes. uh, uh, come out. Many of the monsters we talked about today appear in Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Oh, they do. So in various horrific manners. So well, you'll have to discover that. Yes, indeed. When it comes out uh, November 9th in game stores, November 20th everywhere else. So look for that then. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll be back with another lore you should know next week. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are going to take a short break and then come back and speak to uh, Robert Wardaw uh, about his longtime D&D campaign. It's up to 36 years. Jesus. Uh, it has been telling the same campaign, <sighs> the same story, using a lot of the tropes that we talk about uh, mm -hmm. here on D&D &D, uh, all the time. So Sweet. I can't wait to find out more about that campaign. So thanks. We'll be back soon.